everyone. So thanks for inviting me here, Silicon Republic. Pleasure to be back in Dublin again. Last time I was here was in April, and uh, it's good to be here again. So I'm going to be talking on this topic um, uh, of the kinetic consumer with a question is the theme. How ready are you? How ready really are you for the kinetic consumer? Um, I ask people a lot that question. The answer typically is, yes, we're ready, but how really ready are you? I'm hoping to throw a bit of light on that over the next 15 minutes, and I'm conscious that uh, that is my time limit. So let me just put my watch just right here. So um, start up, thanks for that eloquent introduction, by the way, Matt. Um, if you want to find out more, I'm on LinkedIn, as no doubt all of you are, I expect. Um, I'm Jangles on Twitter. If you'd like to connect that way, I welcome that. I'm actually going to give you a glimpse of something. Uh, I debated whether to call this approximate reality or proximate probably interchangeable, uh, but it's a snapshot look at what's happening in the context of that question, are you ready? Uh, so we, we'll jump straight into something, a view of things that are going on. Ten years ago, the internet was hardly visible to most people. It was early adopter days, the advent of social media, blogging, all that kind of stuff. I was there at that time for this phase of development. But we've come a very long way, as you can see from, uh, from the metrics on that particular slide, uh, that make it quite interesting. New technologies are everywhere. Those of you in the tech industry certainly should recognize this. If anyone's from Gartner here, you will certainly know this. The hype cycle, one of them, they published many. This is the one on the merging technologies that came out a few months back. Um, what's interesting isn't so much the individual technologies, and this is almost like a light bulb moment for many. Uh, where things haven't happened yet or the expectation is so huge that the reality is going to be very disappointing for many, that is typical. Uh, what, what is interesting is seeing what needs to happen for a tipping point for these technologies uh, that enable people to do things. So the best analogy is the mobile phone, which uh, you, we've all experienced this, I'm sure. I'm certainly, I'm certainly uh, tell you I have. I have a phone, uh, a Samsung Galaxy, in fact, that lets me... Uh, open it up to me on facial recognition. It's terrific. It doesn't always work well with my glasses if there's light reflecting because it doesn't know who I am. Uh, I can talk to the phone and ask it to do things. Sometimes it doesn't recognize my voice or the GPS can't find me. All of these things are barriers to the technology being valuable to people. But when things come together well in sets, that's when you have a huge takeoff. And we've seen that with a number of technologies. So I don't expect to read that, uh, uh, that hype cycle. You can get the deck after this, by the way. It will be on SlideShare. Uh, but you can explore some of those things and see if you can understand what's possible, what's not right now amongst all the hype. And there is a huge amount of it. 4G, we have a huge amount of hype about that. The iPhone 5 was launched last week. It's available, I think, today, right? Uh, and we're already hearing, certainly in the UK, about the wonders of 4G and what it can do for people. We have one of the mobile operators in the UK, EE, the combination of Orange and T-Mobile, saying they have 4G right now. And I gather, I think it's T-Mobile in Germany is the other European network. So two networks in two European countries have 4G, so it's not readily available. I'm seeing already lots of stories in the tech press about actually it's not really 4G. It's kind of 3G and forget about LTE even. So what does all of that mean to your average consumer? I think it means that the expectation will be m not met, be unmet, certainly. So that's probably at the peak of inflated expectations on that hype cycle graph. But that is part of the landscape that we're currently looking at. Uh, you've seen the report, I think, on your table uh, of all those gorgeous metrics about mobile use, behaviors, uh, the convergence and the kinetic consumer. So I don't have any of those kind of stats. You can get all of that. To me, this sums up where things are going. This is a graph from GigaOM that was published a few months ago showing the increase in data use on mobile compared to voice. Um, it's not so much a decline as a steady line, whereas data is rapidly increasing. You can draw from that. Clearly, you need devices to do all of these things. So the market is pretty huge. But that's part of the landscape. We can do more with our devices. We look at shifts that are happening in our societies that affect behaviors. We hear news that Encyclopedia Britannica stopped printing the printed version after 170 odd years. No more is the Encyclopedia Britannica available in print. You can get it digital. The culprit 
isn't just Wikipedia, uh, but it was the tipping point to the closure. Uh, there are other digital offerings that are around that Encyclopedia Britannica did not adjust to. So that's pretty, pretty high profile. We're seeing already the first steps of something that, in my view, is going to be very, very common very soon, which is influence ranking according to your social profile, your social graph, your social activity in jobs, in recruitment. This is in the United States, salesforce.com, hiring someone where one of the desired attributes is a clout score of 35 minimum. So if you were less than 35, you wouldn't get an interview. That's coming, I, I believe. And we already hear anecdotal stories of checking in at uh, hotels in Las Vegas and they check your clout score. If it's high, you get a free upgrade, things like that. So that's coming. That's going to be part of the landscape. And people will make what they will of it and form judgments and opinions, rightly or wrongly, based on the number. Huge debates going on about the validity of these things, but it is part of the landscape. We've got the first bank in New York that, uh, called Moven Bank that is an online bank. There's no plastic cards, none of that kind of thing, but part of the process by which they decide whether they want you as a customer or not is your profile on social networks. So when you go to the website, in fact, you can check in with Twitter or Facebook do a profile to, for you to see how you fit in the bank's profile and whether it's something you want to do as well. That's a first, too. Uh, is that going to be part of the landscape? I believe it will be. So where does all this fit with this smart consumer? This is part of the landscape of tools and channels, abilities that set the framework to let people do the things they want to do. So in tandem with that is the desire and the behavior shift to do these things, and that is very clearly there with the connected consumer. I'm sure you will recognize some of your own behaviors and those bullet points you see on the slide of things that you do. The first thing I always do, I have to say, is skip the ads on the TV, because I can. I have a, a device that lets me do that. I watch very little live TV, most of it's recorded. Skip the ads, terrific. Not good news for advertisers, so there's got to be new ways to do these things. Look at how more than one device has entered the landscape as well. Uh, this is a terrific report from Google that was published a month or so back on the multi-screen world, and you'll see some interesting metrics there uh, that show what people do when they, are, when they have the means to do it. And you, you're talking more than just watching TV and tweeting on your, on your handset or, or putting likes on Facebook. You're talking about behaviors that people do when they're out shopping, for instance. I do it too. You're in a shop and you're checking Amazon whilst you're in the shop for the product to see if it's cheaper on Amazon. If you don't need it right now, you'll buy it. I do that a lot, buy it there and then in that store for delivery from Amazon, because I can do that. It's getting quite sophisticated. There was a report a few months ago from McKinsey, which brings this into very sharp perspective from a business point of view. It shows some very, very interesting uh, statistics you can see on the slide there, uh, how many people are online, what their behaviors are, how much money could be saved or made if the potential of this was tapped in the right way. And the potential isn't so much looking at the tech, it's more about behaviors. It's more about how organizations need to shift to enable these things in those organizations. I'm talking about employees in business to business. I'm talking about shoppers who go to those organizations, interact with the employees of those organizations. Business to consumer, whatever label you want to give it, interactions between people that lead to some kind of exchange in some way for a good or a service. And the ways in which we do these things, there are barriers to them. In my view, the barriers that are the significant ones that need to change are the people barriers. So that's partly what I'm looking forward to discussing in our panel, actually, that point. So we have that one. Uh, there was another report published by Deloitte about a month ago. Now, this one's quite interesting, too. Complementary to McKinsey, this one focuses on social software, one of those labels that applies to the tools and the channels, to blogs, to wikis, to Twitter, to Facebook, all the social networks, all of that stuff. And it's summarized in a lengthy report for this slide, actually says the whole story. Uh, profound changes are underway, and you cannot ignore them. The most difficult aspect for many organizations, I believe, is those who think that they are making these changes in the right way. Um, there is the, m the most difficulty. Rather than learning what this is and how to apply it, it's kind of unlearning some poor practices. And that's 
probably the most difficult challenge. I'm increasingly having conversations along those lines with the companies that I talk to, helping them unlearn some useless practices that they think they're getting it. So a Facebook page is not a strategy, for example. And that's not the be-all and end-all of what you're trying to enable your employees to do. It's part of the process, of course. But companies must be strategic. C clearly an obvious one. Decisive. Companies must act now. The exhortations in the report are quite clear. I liked the second bullet in particular. Skeptics will finish last. And that's always been true, hasn't it? So if you doubt this, your competitors who don't doubt it are forging ahead. I mean, it's a simple argument, I know. But I believe it is quite valid. So we're seeing uh, a landscape that is evolving in ways that we can imagine some of it. There are ways that perhaps we hadn't thought of that we're seeing, yeah, maybe there's something happening there, the tipping point of multiple technologies converging that suddenly enable people to do things. You've probably heard uh, one that comes to my mind, NFC, Near Field Communication. Huge amount of hype and boy, this is going to do amazing things for us. It hasn't really taken off. It requires devices to have the technology built in. Most smartphones don't. I saw a story yesterday on Engadget, one of the um, uh, tech blogs, about a mouse Hewlett Packard's just launched that is NFC enabled. So it lets you interact with your computer. And I'm thinking, so why, what's different about that than Bluetooth? Point though to me is that could that be the useful technology that people recognize a value to them without worrying about the tech? So in a sense, maybe Hewlett Packard has built a better mousetrap. Could that be it? Possible. 